Inside the Birds is back. What's going on, everyone? Jeff Mosher, Adam Kaplan here to finish our two part podcast series breaking down training camp battles on Monday morning. Uh, we did the offensive camp battles adam when man we went over an hour because there's just so many different positions because we're not just talking starters we're talking yeah. those last spots and then obviously the defense there's even more question marks and uh, some some more uncertainty so we'll get into each position where the battles are because as we sit here today thursday morning adam the the, the, day, the calendar is getting closer and closer and closer to training camp and we have some new information to discuss about the joint practices that are going to come out uh, that have come out, so we'll talk about that, and um, really uh, then start to move in to midsummer here, and uh, we'll get closer to training camp. We'll do our stories podcast soon. I know everybody's been anxiously awaiting that one. We're we're compiling our stories as we go by the day. This could be uh, some pain. This should be fun. There'll be some fun. Yeah. yeah, there'll be some pain with some of these stories. I'm going to put it, some stuff out there that I'm not. I wouldn't say I'm not proud of it. Just I. It's just just typical of this business. Um, of, of the, the landscape and deal with agents and clubs. And there's a running joke in the reporting business. You're, you're not anybody if you haven't been yelled at. <laughs> oh, Jeff's yeah, that's true. It. Right. Jeff's been through it. He's got, oh, man. well, there's one story that I, we won't, we won't give it away, but there's one that is just so ridiculous and absurd. It's just the absurdity of agents. Yeah. Jeff yeah. just got a great story. One, um, of, one of many that I could tell, but yeah. One yes, that, I know yeah. we all do. Right. Right. <laughs> but that'll be fun. That'll be fun. That we'll see where that goes. Cause the great one of the, the beautiful things about doing the show together with you for four four seasons now, 18, 19, 20, yeah, this has been the fourth season. It's like we have an outline of what we'd like to talk about. Mm -hmm. But depending on how you react or I react to something you said or I said, we'll take it in a different direction. You just don't know sometimes. That's the beauty of unscripted uh, podcasting, radio, or television, and obviously QA, especially. Um, yeah. You have an out idea of what you'd like to do, but if you say something that spurs an idea, oh, whoops, you know what? I thought, uh, let's go this way. Right. So that'll be fun. Speaking, uh, sp yeah. speaking of Q&A, um, yeah. yes. Q&A show, which dropped Wednesday morning, just shows you how difficult the NFC East is to determine. Um, there's various levels. We, we went through it all with Greg Cosell. Um, you can make some pretty strong arguments of improvements in areas for every team. You can point out every team's weaknesses. Um, you know, we clearly, you and I have talked about it. We, we do think that Certain teams stand out as better than the others. You know, Washington's defense, Dallas's offense, the Giants' balance, and what they've done this offseason. Uh, Q&A had a little bit of a back and forth on their show about the division and who they expect to compete. And I thought it was pretty interesting because Jason was pretty adamant that he felt that Washington was probably best poised to win the division, knowing full well that there has not been a repeat champion in 17 years. But – he said, look, they won it last year. They probably shouldn't, but they did. But all the offseason changes they made, not just bringing in Ryan Fitzpatrick, but Curtis Samuel and William Jackson, just adding to a defense that was already starting to become elite and then adding some offensive weapons there. He, he said that they he clearly sees them as the team to beat in the division. Q, first pick Giants, then went to Dallas. Then he kind of went, well, one of those two. Uh, he, feels that, he feels Washington's the worst team. In the division. He felt like they just worse won a really Eagles? bad division. Yeah, he thought they were worse Whoa. than the Eagles. Whoa. So uh, what, what a crazy division. You know, I, again, I, I encourage everyone to go back and listen to our four-part podcast series with uh, Greg Cosell. And I, you, you'll he breaks it down so well with us, Adam, that you, I agree that you can come away with it thinking differently of all the teams, but at least you're informed on everything these teams have done throughout the offseason to get better. You know, it's funny. It's you know, you bring this up. Um, does someone want to pick that phone up? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, after doing those four shows, I would rank them: the Giants one, Cowboys two, Washington three, Eagles four. So I'm kind of with Q. The, the, the issue we know how great Dak Prescott is, and he's coming off a serious injury. They have major questions on defense. Washington's major questions at quarterback. Giants have questions at quarterback, but. Cosell kind of outlined it. Their line isn't quite as bad as everyone said. It wasn't good enough, but they their, their offensive line's got issues. So, And obviously, the Eagles have some significant issues on both sides of the football. There's a lot of questions. It's kind of like, who's got the least amount of questions right now in the, for, for the NFC East teams? And I, I kind of said, uh, I think the Giants do. Uh, certainly, mm -hmm. quarterback has got a question mark. But 
Right. That's that. That's the beauty of that division. I, I have no idea who's going to win it. I'm no, no one I don't know. I've tried well, to ask myself, you know, who has the most ta- – like if you were doing a draft of the NFC East, all the teams, and you ignored aging, right? You just were drafting on talent alone. Who would be the first five picks in the draft? Just on talent alone. In the NFC East, and then honestly, I went, I went back and forth. I mean, you've got that's awesome. We, can we do that a show? We would we probably do that. Let, let's I do that, that as we get closer to camp. And yeah, do our, that's our, a great our idea. Review. Because yeah. you can make a, a strong argument for a lot of different number ones. I mean, obviously, Dak as a quarterback. Yep. Uh, in the division is going to be good, but if you could get Chase Young, how good he was. I mean, the two tackles for Washington are really good. Um, Brandon Brooks, if he's still an all-pro right guard, or Lane Johnson is is an all-pro right tackle. Remember, we're just we're talking about talent, not injuries, just just on talent alone. I mean, Ezekiel Elliott had a down year last year, but there's a lot of talk that uh, he lost weight and is ready to have a much better year this year. So, I, man, this whole this whole division has got some really, I would say, it has intrigue to it. I like it. I, I think it's going to be fun to watch these teams grow. Uh, throughout the year. James Bradbury, that's an underrated guy. What a great corner he was for the He Giants. is probably, if you look at the four teams, mm-hmm. Slay is, is good. Bradbury might be better. Yeah, I would uh, think William so. Jackson's good. So, yeah, mm-hmm. if, if you drift, if you drafted, okay, if you drafted 22 starters on both sides of the football to take your all NFC East team, I do wonder how many Eagles would be on that team. Yeah, you do. Do I mean Tank Lawrence, really good pass rusher for Dallas. So yeah, there's, I, I there's a know. lot of good players. I mean, other than Fletcher Cox, Hargrave, I would put on there. Uh, Slay, receivers can't say that yet because they haven't they haven't really done anything. Um, yeah, Smith, but, you know, Lane and Br- Brandon. I mean, yep. Kelsey Kelsey is a good player, but I think he got a little last year of the name recognition honoring yeah. more than how how well yeah. he actually played. But yeah. um, but yeah, yeah, no, it's really. Be fantastic. Uh, all right, so we're going to do the defensive uh, battles in this pod. I also want to draw some attention to not just the recent stuff we've done with Greg Cosell. We had a, a very good Ask ITB last week. That's still on the YouTube channel, getting views where we answer a lot of questions about Zach Ertz, Jordan Mailata, the Steven Nelson saga. So if you're you're looking <laughs> for the updated on all that, so you can still check that out because not much has changed since we last did that. I also want to say thanks to a couple of people really quickly, Adam. First of all, our interns have done an unbelievable job all year long, all summer long, talking about Tyler Strasser, Justin Morgenstein, Zane Gonzalez. They have just been fantastic in helping us accomplish what we're trying to do as far as growing the brand, using social media, um, our website, InsideTheBirds.com, the analytics that we've been doing. By the way, we will have more uh, analytic-based information on our pods coming forward. Uh, we have stuff on Jalen Hurts and stuff on the coaching staff that we're mm-hmm. going to get into in, in very soon podcast uh, from an analytics standpoint. So big thanks to them. And also, Adam, a couple of weeks ago, I meant to mention this last time we did a show. Uh, I was on the boardwalk in Ocean City with my family, uh, New Jersey, and I was just sitting there. Uh, my, my, my wife, my kids, they were using the bathroom. I was sitting there with my youngest daughter and a guy approached me and uh, he said his name was Chris. And he said, look, I don't want to bother you. I just want to say I'm a big fan of the Inside the Birds podcast. Love what you guys do. So I wanted to shout him out, thank him for for coming up. I, I don't mind when people come up and say something like that. It's, it's very nice. And uh, so if Chris is – he said he was a diehard listener. So I, I imagine awesome. he's going to listen Chris. to this at some point, and we're going to say awesome. thank you, Chris, and thank hope you. you had a good time there out in Ocean City. Also, right. uh, can ahead. I add to that? Uh, yes. It's funny you bring this up. So um, – my sister-in-law's brothers, uh, the Smiths, Billy. Uh, geez, I don't get this wrong here. I'm trying to. Oh, Richie, yeah, Rich. I saw Rich and uh-huh. um, oh, Jerry. They are Eagle season ticket holders. They sit. I don't give the exact section away. It's in the 700s, right? Last oh, row. Okay, this says a lot show. about them, <laughs> right? They're diehards. No, they're Northeast Philly. They're great guys, and they love the platform. They listen to Q and A and us. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want, want to give them a shout out. I just saw them at my brother's 70th uh, birthday party gotcha. uh, last weekend, and uh, they they made a point to bring it up that they listen, man. They uh, they love it, so um, g- good to see that. And uh, look, the as we get started here, the, the cool news and I had heard the Eagles were going to practice with the Patriots. That was that was what Belichick was alluding to um, mm-hmm. like a month ago. He didn't want to get he because it wasn't conf- it wasn't fully confirmed yet. But mm-hmm. this one, they're doing two sets. The Eagles. How about how about this one? They're doing the. They're going to host the uh, Eagles. Are going to host the Patriots, right? 
and then they they go to the Jets. I, I was kind of surprised they would do it that late, but I you know I keep forgetting there's not a fourth preseason game, right. but it's around that preseason game. Um, so how about that, man? How about that? Two sets of joint practices for Nick Sirianni and the Eagles. Yeah, I, I think the only thing that surprised me about it with the Jets was that they they play the Jets this year. So um, you don't necessarily love to uh, – you're already playing them in a preseason game, right? So now yeah. you're you're practicing up. And the Eagles will, will, will tell you, you know, part of them getting Jay Ajayi uh, a few years ago in their Super Bowl run was the joint practices against the Dolphins and what they learned – by watching tape from those joint practices. So it's always a little dicey when you're playing a team that year in the regular season and you do a joint practice against them. In fact, Q&A brought this up on their podcast. Q Quinn Actually, Michael when, when? Are you sure the Eagles play the Jets? I'm going for the, the Patriots and the Jets. Wait, no, 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 I'm talking about in the regular 17th season. 17th game this year. Wait. It's wait. the extra, ex extra game. Oh, yeah, yeah. Where the hell? I'm looking on the schedule. I'm not seeing it here. Okay. <laughs> it's on Weird. there. I, yeah, yeah, definitely. Because remember, they're playing the Giants and the Jets, so they're going to MetLife Stadium in back-to-back -back weeks. In I think yeah, December. it's weird. I'm on the Jets uh, website, and it's weird. It just doesn't show it here. They don't want to acknowledge. Oh, week thirteen. That. Okay. <laughs> now, now I had to re I had to reload it. Week thirteen. Right. Well, here's a question. Because mm -hmm. we with the Eagles, this this has happened to the Eagles before, where they played a team the preseason, they'd play them the regular season. Right. Did do they do recall, it last year? By the way, did they pr joint practice at all last year? No, last year was COVID. No, right? they, they didn't have they, they didn't have a preseason. No, right, right. Um, the question to you would be: Did they last or not last year? But over time, do you remember a time when they had a joint practice? Because I know they they had the Patriots in here when Tebow was with New England. Ooh, that was not pretty. Mm. But do you remember a time when they did it? They had a joint practice, and then other than obviously J J J, it's a great point because that. Howie Roseman actually said that, that that helped him get intel. Mm -hmm. Where you thought maybe watching that, it did something spur a, 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 like a, a memory of that, a joint practice where you thought maybe the Eagles might have given up some kind of advantage? No. The only thing I can think of is when they had the one against the Patriots several years ago and Tom Brady came in. I was going to save this for the stories pod, but it's relevant for now. I'll Tom Brady, I, I was there. You were there too. Tom Brady treated the Eagles defense like it was a Pop Warner defense. I mean, it was really sad and pathetic. I get that these drills are often designed for the offense to win anyway, but for a guy to just come there and, and not, I don't know, he must have thrown 50 balls and not put any, they, I think that every single ball was 27. caught stride in the, it perfectly placed, and he just yeah. made Eagles corners look look bad. It and was, the Eagles corners were bad. <laughs> yeah, it was 20, I charted, I, I don't, I haven't chartered in years, but for some reason, because I, I, I had been a Patriot training camp a couple times, but I just want to see how he was doing. Uh -huh. As you're saying it, I see it in front of me. He throws timing and anticipation just about every pass. Yeah. Okay, this is where I'm throwing it. Go get it. There was not a deflection. It was. I remember charting it was 27 of 27 mm -hmm. uh, for the period that I watched. It was the most. It was the most ridiculous practice I've ever seen in my life. I, I've seen some great training camp practices from quarterbacks, but this is what year it was, was just it absurd. Uh, I'm sorry. What year did you say it was? I think it was 2015. Yeah, that positive. sounds about right. Chip Kelly, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably so would have been right. With Chip so he's thrown up against there. what the Carry 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 Williams is and um, and I guess Byron Maxwell's of the world at that time, right? I mean, that the sounds Eagles right, yeah. So many things. Bradley Fletcher was, I don't know. All I know is that, that I mean, like, couldn't he have just sneezed and accidentally misfired on one pass? Like, <laughs> there was absolutely... Now, and he, he might as well have just been playing against air. And, and so that had to be pretty humbling for the Eagles' pass defense that year. Um, it, just to, I got to tell you. You know, not I, I stop a single you. pass. I'm sorry? Just to not stop a single pass must have been pretty humbling. Oh, it was unbelievable. And But I got to tell you, someone loves football. It was the coolest thing I've ever seen. It was just – Yeah. It was just – it was pretty special to see something like that. Yeah, I like you, joint you, practices. I think media – we like oh, it yeah. because it's, it's like – it's a, it's a break – up of the monotony of training camp. Uh, it adds a little spice to it. You see new players. You see – and Quentin Michael addressed this. They, it, there's, it certainly ratchets up the level of competition. But the problem is, and this is why Q does not like joint practices theoretically, because you ratchet – you naturally, as a player, ratchet up your level of competition when you see a different team across you. Mm -hmm. But there are too, so many restrictive rules about – contact and what you can do 
that you almost have to dial yourself down after dialing yourself up. And it's very difficult. You'd rather just go out there and kind of have that mutual spectrum on your own team. You know, you're not supposed to hit your teammates. It's hard to not hit a player from an opposing team that you're training yourself 24-7, 365 to want to hit or, or beat. So I can understand the mentality of a player, how th- these would be very difficult. And then there was some sensitivity about how much you want to show another team while they're at your house or while you're at their house, especially if you do play them that year. You know what? It was actually, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty certain of this now that I'm looking this up. It was actually 2013. That's when pa- Tebow was with the Patriots. Right, right. Oh, I thought it was when Tebow was with the Eagles that, um, I, that I, I don't, Brady I, came I, down. Maybe I, I just, what I do know is that training camp when, 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 um, when Brady was here, I just know Tebow was on one of the teams and how bad Tebow was holding the ball down, that crazy way that he threw it. You know, the joke was he had like a stack of Bibles down there. That's what people were saying. Because, you know, he would – it would mm-hmm. weigh his arm down. But just the way he would throw it, it's just the oddest throwing motion. Um, but it was pretty cool from a football standpoint to see that. Um, ju- just just the timing and rhythm of the way that he threw the football was just absurd. Now, in 2015 right. – they did. They did play at New England um, several you know, years ago, but uh, yeah, I don't know. But seeing Brady here was something else. And well, we're going to see Cam Newton and Matt Jones. That's what we're going to see, and then we're going to see Zach Wilson. And you and yeah. I, I know I'm definitely going to be there. Um, and, yeah. and I think you told me you want to go. So yeah, I'll be there. I'm Great. sure I'll get to at least one or two of those practices. That should be yeah. very fun. And they're two days each, by the way. Two days each. Right. 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 All right, so um, let's get into uh, the the actual, you know, the meat and the potatoes here. First, I want to remind everyone to don't be a loser. Stop paying full retail price for things you want. Get on Deal Dash. Go to DealDash.com or download the app. And when you register, enter that promo code ITB for a special offer for some bonus free bids. That's ITB for a special offer for bonus free bids using Deal Dash or DealDash.com. All right, Adam, so let's take a look at this defense um, that we have to go through. There's going to be a lot of competition, mainly because at many positions, there's not a whole lot of blue chip talent. And so that opens up the doors for a lot of people, especially young guys, to come in and, and get some playing time, maybe uh, maybe get a starting job. You want to start with de- – let, let's go from inside out, and we will start with defensive tackle. Um, we know we got the starters. That, that much is clear. Javon Hargrave, Fletcher Cox. We have talked about this before. They really cannot afford to have an injury among the starters because you have a lot of question marks afterward. Uh, you have Hassan Ridgeway, who came over from the Colts. So he showed the defense. He's been here for a couple of years. He struggles to stay healthy. Decent player when he plays, but he has struggled to stay healthy. And then Milton Williams is the who I think they still have to figure a lot out. You know, short arm guy, but very athletic. Um, going to play a little bit of end and inside and outside. So they're going to move him around. Not sure if they feel like he can start yet, if need be, if there was an injury, but we're going to find out a lot about him. And then of course you got the other rookie Marlon Tui Pelotu and uh, Raekwon, the chef Williams. So you got, you got an interesting group of guys there who I feel like we've talked about some of these guys as far as potential, but never really, you know, outside of the top two, we don't talk about what they've accomplished in this league. So I don't think Williams would be would would play in very much. I know he can. And he probably will play some in. I think he's going to play more tackle. The way mm-hmm. I understand it, than end. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ridgeway, you know, he was trained. They they acquired him in 2019. As you said, he's had a bunch of injuries. He hasn't played very much. But I know in training camp wise, I know they they felt he's done pretty well. So to me, right now, if the season started today, it doesn't. But if it did, Ridgeway would be the three. They don't have a four or five. I. Here are a couple questions here. Will they keep four D tackles or five? Uh, that's a that's a certainly a, a fair question. And then if they only keep four, is there anyone you know in, in nickel? Can they slide somebody inside if they needed to? Uh, they have traditional versatility. Yeah, Joshua has played inside before. Graham's played inside before. So uh, I do think they want to keep Tui Pelotu because they felt that that. Um, they felt that he was a great value. They thought uh, that he probably could have gone in the fourth round. And you know, you heard Greg Cosell's comments on him. He really likes that kid. Yeah, so. I think it, I think it sets up to keep five, Adam, the, the starting two. I, I tend to think just based on the feedback you and I have got that they're going to root pretty hard here for Tui Pelotu and that if he shows up and 
shows potential. He's going to make the team as a six round pick. Uh, obviously, Milton Williams will make the team as a as a third round pick, but that's two rookies, and so that's why I feel like you need that veteran. So either they go with Hassan Ridgeway or they wind up bringing in a veteran around the cutdown. But if you're going to keep those two rookies, then you need an in between guy. You need a veteran who can come in and play a lot of snaps if Cox or Hargrave gets hurt. So that's either going to be Ridgeway. Because I, who who else is going? Raekwon Williams maybe has a chance, but again, that's almost like going with a rookie because he's not really played a whole lot. Or I think you're going to address that position at the veteran cut at the, at the fi- around the final cuts. So I I have it. This is the way I see it: Hargrave, Cox, mm-hmm. Ridgeway, Williams are obvious. Tui Pelotu, because you had that note a couple months ago about John McGannon wanting a nose tackle. Correct. Correct. He's going to make it. Unless Tui Pelotu is bad, they're going to keep five. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I only see him keeping four DNs, Barnett, Graham, Kerrigan, Ridgeway. I mean, Kerrigan and Sweat. Now, the battle at D-tackle, obviously Ridgeway right now would be a three. Theoretically, Tui Pelotu could be, like when we say three, there could be certain games where they're going against a run-heavy team. Let's say they were playing Detroit because we know it's coming. It's going to be all about the run game with them. If they were playing a, a heavy run team, that – that like like Minnesota, by the way, because Minnesota, the first thing they want to do if their defense is healthy, because last year the defense was healthy, they threw the ball a little bit more than they wanted to. But if you're going to play against a heavy run team, maybe Tui Polo two plays a little bit more than he normally would, um, as a nose you know, to, to help out. So he's got really good value. I, would, I pretty much would agree with you there. Now, Deanne, I only see four. Before we know, sweats the three. Now Kerrigan, because he's going to have. He's going to be a stand-up linebacker, and he's going to be a DN. And how, how that, how many snaps he gets at each position, I have no idea because they they have to they have to get through that. You know, this is mm-hmm. a new defense for him. Mm-hmm. So, and then Williams obviously can play DN, so he could be the fifth DN if they need him to. So that's it, man. I, I would see right now a four D uh, nine D lineman, four DNs, five D tackles. Mm-hmm. The D the D tackle rotation will take care of itself. We know who they are. As you said, we just don't know from game to game how it's going to be. And, and then I do run. A, if, I do one of this. If Milt Williams is great, let's say he tears it up in the preseason training camp. Not that he's taking any time away from Hargrave or Cox. A does he play ahead of Ridgeway? And are there? Do they figure out a way to stand him up because he's, as you said, sure arm guy? Is there a way that they could? free him up to get to the quarterback. Who knows? Yeah, I almost think you use them differently. Just like how, you know, just for example, you didn't use Bo Allen the same way that you used uh, I'm trying to think of another backup defensive tackle from from that 2017-18 team. But Bo Allen would come in as a second string run stuffing defensive tackle. Other yes. guys like Brandon Graham would move in and be a pass rushing defensive tackle. I think Ridgeway with his experience in that Tampa 2 system under Iberflus a couple of years ago and then being here is a guy who can probably adjust and play that that um, shade technique that they want, that that one, right? He, he's a good – he was known as a good run stopper. I don't think he has the burst that a guy like Milton Williams is supposed to come with. So I think if it's third and two, right, and you're in nickel, but you want to make sure you're facing Dallas and you want to make sure you got an answer for Zeke in case they pop a run on you, you may have Ridgeway in there. If it's third and six – and you want to get a little, you know, you're you're you've been on the field for a while, and you want to take either Hargrave or Cox off. You put you may put Williams in there, uh, do a lot of twisting, stunting, use that athleticism to move him around a little bit to get him at the quarterback. So it, I, I see them as two different kind of guys. So there's room to play them both. Just have to be situational, if that makes sense. Sure. Like like for instance, let's say when they play the Jets in Week 13, right? The Jets mm-hmm. are probably going to be heavy 11 because of their receiver group they've got two slots they've got they have a much deeper receiver court right so you're if they're going to play 11 for majority of the game you know like say 65 percent of the snaps then if you're going to play nickel you know you're going to be you're at your five dbs you're going to want to rotate your ends a little bit because they're going to be throwing a lot most Mm -hmm. likely Mm-hmm. Uh, th- though, though, look, they, I know it's a, a Mike Shannon type uh, and Kyle Shannon type offense Michael Ford's going to run, but they still by personnel have a lot. They're, they're pretty deep at receiver. Mm-hmm. So if they're a team that's going to play with tempo and they're going to move them and they're going to go 11, you might go with lighter DNs. You, you might not go as, with, the, with the bigger guys where your guy, Milton Williams, could, might play a little bit. Maybe he plays a little bit at end. Maybe 
Maybe they play um, Kerrigan more at linebacker the game. Who knows? They, the good thing about this group is it's a little different from last year's group because of the youth. That's that's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing. All right. It's amazing the conversation, how much it's changed in a year about the defensive end picture because last year we would talk about, well, who has a chance to make it as the fifth and possibly sixth defensive end? And this year, I, I agree with you. There's, there's four defensive ends that are making this team and maybe – not anymore. The four are the ones you mentioned: Graham, Barnett, Sweat, and um, Kerrigan. Sure. And, and but the but the reason you can do that is because you may keep a linebacker like Jannard Avery, who's really a pass rusher by trade, and that's kind of like you know like your tweener, like uh, almost like the way you keep a corner who can play safety or a safety who can play corner or nickel because you know you can put him there. Like Jalen Mills last year, perfect example. I think they went a little shorter on corners going into the year numerically because they knew Jalen Mills could slide over and he actually wound up doing that when they needed it. So they will only keep four natural defensive ends. I can't imagine, you know, Joe Osman's going to comp compete, but uh, he's probably going to be, I would think, on the outside looking in here. Well, he's playing a linebacker, as we reported three right. months ago. Osman right. and Avery, Avery was the new information we got. We heard he was lining up at strong side linebacker mm -hmm. with Osman. Mm -hmm. Uh and again, Williams could be, if somebody gets hurt, if they think he's ready to, he could play in, you know, because he's got that positional versatility. So that that pretty much does it. Um, the battles, again, at D-tackle, the, the nice thing, again, is they're all young. I'm not including, well, Raekwon Williams will maybe push, because I know they like him. They gave him pretty good guaranteed money at signing. Mm -hmm. He's an undirected free agent, too. Like McGill's back again. Willie Henry's there. But the real competition is Williams versus Ridgeway versus Tui Pelotu in terms of roles and how many snaps they get and so forth. Right. Should be an interesting one. It's not necessarily the sexiest battle, and sometimes in training yeah. camp, yeah. it's hard to really get a feel for it just with your own eye. We'll have to rely on on sources and things like that because there's there's no running, uh, there's limited contact, so you're really yeah. going to have to we we'll have to be uh in our in our sources to get it's with their hands, good information. right? Yeah, what they do in practices. It, it's not about so much the contact; it's about how they use their hands at D alignment, how they get through. Are they right. relentless? Do they Technique. do they win? Do they win right. on seven on seven, eleven on eleven? Seven on right. seven is a you know it's a passing drill. How are they able to get in on that? Are they able to get in when they do team? As Jeff said, look, they're not really tackling. Right. They, they typically have the thud drill where they use an elbow, a shoulder to take a guy down or to, to hit the guy, but they're not really taking them down by tackling. So look, it's uh it's good. There, there's question marks. And again, with Kerrigan before we moved to linebacker, he might have a dual role, but we and he he didn't lose anything. He's 33 years old. It's just that they they drafted so many first rounders. What He's kind of out of a job, so um, he's an elder statesman statesman here around these young kids who are playing on the inside. This is this is going to be a good group. I'm, I'm glad that they're mixing up a little bit. Definitely a young group and some guys who have some interesting potential that I look forward to kind of yeah. seeing how they grow and, and develop over the years. All right, we will move on to linebacker, uh, talk about the competitions there. First, DraftKings Sportsbook, not only our favorite sportsbook, but America's top-rated sportsbook. We love using DraftKings Sportsbook, easy to navigate. Plenty of instructions for new betters. Nearly limitless ways to get in on all of the action. Our friends and family have been loving DraftKings Sportsbook, and we know you will too. Listen to this great offer that we've been giving you from DraftKings. They're putting you courtside with a chance to turn a dollar into a hundred dollars in site credits. You just pick any of the two basketball teams still left in contention. You bet a dollar, and if that team wins, you win a hundred dollars in site credits. Don't forget. DraftKings Sportsbook also offers great odds and promotions on baseball, ho well, not hockey anymore, but um, so many other sports all week long. DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable, so you can deposit and withdraw your funds at your convenience. So download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use the promo code ITB when you sign up to turn a dollar into $100 in free credits. Bet on the basketball team of your choice, only two. And if that team wins, and you can claim $100 in free credits. That's promo code ITB for a limited time only at DraftKings Sportsbook. You have to be 21 or older, Pennsylvania only, new customers only, wager paid out, and site credits restrictions apply in partnership with Meadows Racetrack and Casino. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. All right, let us discuss this linebacker situation. I was a little surprised um, when Q&A went through – Someone asked them to to answer who they predicted to be the starting linebackers and the starting defensive ends. And you know what? They answered it the most honest way possible. 
They didn't. <laughs> they basically said, how can we answer that question, at least for linebackers right now, without even seeing these guys on the field? You're basically just picking names from a hat. But both of those guys felt that Alex Singleton was kind of more of a lock to be a starter somewhere. And they started talking about Eric Wilson. And by the end, they kind of rationalized that that Eric was brought here for a reason. But yeah. I, I, I talked to them after the show. I said, look, I, I can't imagine Eric Wilson is He's here. Is it, yeah, He's isn't starting or isn't making the team. He's really – their only linebacker, Adam, that has the coverage acumen, you would say that Jonathan Gannon probably wants out of this kind of a defense? You know, it's interesting, though. Cosell said that he thought that Singleton did a good job in coverage last season. I remember talking to him about that privately. Yeah. That he, he, yeah, he really grew on him. So, theoretically, uh, as we get through this, a linebacker, and I'm going to just add one more note to the D-line as we go through it. But Wilson, they're going to be a nickel team. They're going to be a 4 5 team. That's what we've heard since pretty consistently since February. Mm -hmm. Now, we think it's going to be, because there'll be a heavy nickel team, so probably 70% nickel. Wilson and, and and Singleton would make the most sense. The one lock is Wilson. After that, the Singleton lock, to, to be a starter, technically, I'd say pretty good probability. But the question is, if you're not saying he's a lock, then who else could possibly take the job? I don't know. I do. <laughs> I don't know. You got yeah, anything I think it's a great question. No, know. I mean, like, uh, you know, uh, again, this is where the Davion Taylor conversation happens. If if he can somehow make a huge jump, he has the athleticism to be a cover linebacker that you would want. He can run, he can fly, but he has to know where he's going, who he's covering. I mean, there's before you can walk, you have to crawl. And we saw no evidence of crawling last year because he only played 32 snaps. I mean, 16 games, 32 snaps, you can do the math there. It's not a lot of time. So um, <laughs> you would have liked, ideally, to see – like we knew from the start, right, that he was overdrafted based on the information that we got, but that they drafted him because of this great athleticism. So you would have liked – you would you could understand why in September and early October he was not on the field because he just wasn't ready. You would have liked to have seen, as the season went on, more usage, you know, more uh, at least having a role in in a dime, some kind of opportunity. And I think the only snaps he got was basically when games were out of hand or at the goal line, you know, something where it would require an extra linebacker. There was not a role that he was able to carve out for himself by mid-November last year. So I feel like he's still a rookie here. He didn't play enough last year for us to be able to say, well, at least he developed from September to December, sure. right? So that's why it's hard to even have a conversation about him. We, he is a, it's a yet another blank slate for him. Yeah. That pick was the Davion Taylor pick as we, as we were told after the draft, because we were, that was, that was another one where we were like, whoa, 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 whoa. I barely had heard of the guy. And, and as we were getting grades after the draft from various students we spoke with, we were getting fives and sixes on him. Yes. And his pro day really helped him. Now it should not have put him over the top, but his combine was about a four four nine was his best time. His pro day was a four three nine, which is which is basically receiver high, really good receiver numbers. And he is today's linebacker built because today's linebackers are not six three two fifty, they're six six one two twenty five to two thirty five. He's in that range. He's around two twenty eight to two thirty. Um, he's he's just under six foot one half inch. He's got the measurables that you like. Uh, he's got the analytic numbers that you like. Vertical's really good. Broad jumps good. Shuttle's good, three cones good, but and he bench press for guys light as he is actually wasn't bad. It was over twenty. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, this is the knock we got from several teams: lack of instincts for the linebacker position at this level. It just didn't didn't show on tape. It's person uh, personal people could only go go by what they see, and it was kind of like what why did they have in the fifth or sixth round despite the, the measurables and the numbers when they watched him playing? Now part of it's because of his lack lack of experience, but when they saw him run. Uh, playing linebacker at the collegiate level, Colorado, they just didn't see the instincts that you have to have in playing nickel here. Yeah. And I don't know that this could be coach. I, I don't know enough about um, – we know why he was – why teams gave him lower grades, but we didn't – we don't know why he can't make it at this level because he's got the athleticism, as you talked about. Was it that mm -hmm. Baltimore game when he tracked the guy down? What was that game? Was, yeah, that guy was Lamar Jackson. But yeah, oh, was yeah. Lamar? I'm sorry, it was Lamar. Yeah. Okay. 
It was yeah. incredible. It was like I know, whoa. I know. And, I always bring up the point. It's great that he tracked down Lamar Jackson, but Lamar Jackson still got a twenty-something yard run out of it. So I mean, like, it can, you know, you don't. It's wonderful if you can make tackles. It's just better if it's true. near the line of scrimmage. <laughs> true, but no, true. but it showed it showed what he has athletically. Right, right, right. So, so we'll see. Um, they, and, and here's a, and here's the other thing. They got a very young linebackers coach, Nick Nick Rollis. Mm -hmm. Th this is quite the challenge for this guy. Right. Um, you know, we learned under Mike Zimmer, obviously, but this is uh, – I mean, I'm telling you, I remember when they drafted him, as, as, as much criticism as we gave the pick at the time, I did say this, and it still is true. If he can make it as their nickel linebacker, it's a home run because that's why they drafted him to be a nickel linebacker. Mm -hmm. All, plus, if he could play in dimes, you know, be the single linebacker down the road. But that's pie in the sky. That's If this thing works out, I'll give the Eagles credit. Hey, you know what? Um, despite what other teams told us, they got it right. He's the, he's he's one of the two nickel linebackers. If he's a nickel linebacker by year three, home run. Mm -hmm. But if he can't get on the field, not only this season, the second year, by year three, it's probably going to be a miss. Yeah, I, yeah, that's true. And but but you do have to take into account what you didn't get along the way. If I, I would say, like, he's got to at least give you something oh, this in terms year. Of who they didn't pick. Yeah, because yeah. It, you were expecting to win a super or contend for a Super Bowl last year, not knowing that the whole team was going to collapse. And, and and your third round pick is sitting on the bench, not really doing anything. So there are there are there is, you know, obviously you have to give a guy a chance to learn, but it can't just be nothing, nothing, nothing. And then year three, he finally becomes like a decent sure, player. So fair unless enough. he's a yeah, star. But yeah. yeah. Um the best comparison I can kind of draw when we talk about Davion Taylor, and it's not apples to apples, so don't jump all over me, but Doriel Green Beckham was a wide receiver who had tremendous physical capabilities. He had great athleticism. He could run for his size. He was he could jump. He, he was, you know, all the check marks that you want from a wide receiver from a physicality and athleticism standpoint was there, but he couldn't play the position. It just, it just, for whatever reason, and he had some things going on off the field we know from college, but he just wasn't equipped to play in the NFL and didn't have the right mindset. Now, I know that Davion Taylor is a great kid, different story. People call say he's a wonderful kid, but again, that lack of instincts, that lack of pedigree of having played the position is going to hold him back a little bit. So we'll see if, if he can make the jump. And as you mentioned, the coaching is going to be really key, and you'd like them to have a 10-year veteran linebacker coach, but they don't. Doesn't mean Nick Rallis can't do it and surprise people, but it, it's just kind of like more of an – a reason to not give the benefit of the doubt than to give the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. So the guys who went off the board, because you brought it up, your guy, Akeem Davis Gaither, I know you, you talked a lot about him pre-draft. We talked about this post-draft, how that was a guy that could have taken into the first pick in the fourth round. Yep. The Checo uh, was a big fan. Oh, Anthony, uh, oh uh, Andrew Checo, like Davis Gaither. Okay. Um, Greg Cosell's guy, Darnay Holmes. Oh, who's, boy. Uh, yep. Who went fourth overall in the fourth round. Mm -hmm. Um, not not like to be honest with you, the kind of guys that went in the fourth round were all developmental players. No one where you go, oh my God, already that this is a miss. Like the Eagles could have had this guy. Yeah, but the, who who went in the third round after, um, after they picked Taylor? I thought yep, there was a name or two there. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. The guys they could have had. Terrell Burgess didn't. Terrell Burgess is saved for the Rams. We'll see if he contributes. Adam Troutman is going to be the starting tight end for the Saints. They mm -hmm. could have had him. Mm -hmm. I'm out of Dayton. Tyree Phillips, who might wind up starting a guard for the Ravens. Okay. Uh, these were actually compensatory picks. Oh, and also, Davion Taylor was a compensatory pick, but it doesn't matter. Correct. He was, right. he's a 39th player taken in the third round. Wow, 42 picks in that round. No, it's, that's um, a heck of a third round. Yeah, I mean, and right before him, and Parrot, the tackle, the kid from Connecticut who's going to start for the Giants, went at 35. Right. Tanner Muse, who's the, who's a, He's playing linebacker for the Raiders is a total project. Dalton Keenan, who probably won't contribute for the Patriots now that they have too, too many tight ends. Mm -hmm. And Alex Highsmith went right before the Eagles. Now, he's a 34 outside linebacker, so for scheme-wise, he wouldn't fit anyway. So I, you make a very good point. It's, it's always good to look at that stuff, and we'll, we'll, we'll judge this over time. But the, the best part about what you said was the expectations for a third-round pick is the guy should get on the field year one. I know he didn't have, a, he, he didn't have an offseason. I get it. Mm -hmm. Year two – he better he better dress every week. If he doesn't dress every week, you're headed towards non contributorville. That's where you're headed. Right. By the way, Davis Gaither did play in all 16 games for the Bengals uh, and made mm. two starts last year. No, I'm not mm. saying he's a star. I'm sure it right. doesn't mean he sure. played well, but he did but he play and, and yeah. got that experience exactly. 
All right. Uh, so again, let's let's look at this. We've got Eric Wilson as a starter. Alex Singleton likely, depending on what they're going to look. I'm sure Alex Singleton is going to be on the team. I think TJ Edwards is someone we have to discuss because he might be a player who has talent at a certain thing that may or may not fit this defense. He's a downhill thumper. I mean, he was, that's why he made the team because Schwartz needed that for his wide nine defense and Edwards started to play well early on, but this is an entirely new scheme. But I will say, Adam, if you're going to play a lot of cover too, right? Uh, Yeah, I don't know. I don't know exactly. Just, just so you know, I've talked to a Viking people all day. They're not exactly sure exact how much they know they're going to run. He's going to run Zimmer's defense. However, right, he may not run fully coverages like he might do more cover four, mm-hmm. more cover three than cover two. Who knows? So we, we want to be careful of saying they're definitely doing any particular coverage. Sure, right sure. Yet. In any event of playing cover two or quarters or anything where your safeties yeah. are a little bit deeper and you want to stop the run, but you're in nickel, like you're 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 going to need linebackers who are good against the run. Eric Wilson's not considered a really good run stuff more than a coverage guy. So my point is just that you might need kind of a thumper. Maybe you're not starting TJ Edwards, but you may need him for your situational packages where the opponent comes out with two tight ends and you need to get base on and you want, you want, you might want to move Eric Wilson from middle to strong or weak and then have TJ Edwards as your middle and Singleton on the other spot. If you're not rushing the passer, oh yeah, look, this goes back to two below two point. Let's say they're playing a a a, 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 a again a heavy run team. Like, well, I can't say Dallas because they're so good at receiver. <laughs> Dallas literally could do anything they want. Oh, if they Eagles are it's not be good for them. No, um, I, I mean it's funny. I, I I don't root for the Eagles, but I just want to see good football. I I again, I don't, I don't lose any sleep of whether the Eagles lose or win, but I like to see them be competitive. It, it just makes for better watching. And when they play Dallas, it's like, what do you do personnel wise if you're Jonathan Gannon? Okay, so if they're because of Zeke Elliott, and and now that Dak, Dak will run, though some of his runs are not designed. He just, you know, if he doesn't see what he wants, just like mm-hmm. kind of like with Josh Allen, he'll run. Um, Tui Pelotu, and and as you said, this is this is a this is a really good point. Edwards have, may have to play more snaps than they normally would. In, in fact, for Eric Wilson, mm-hmm. and maybe maybe Tua Pelotu is the third D tackle that game. So this is where you've got – this is what I was talking about at, at, on the D line here. You've got some advantages here because you've got younger guys like Williams who could play two positions. Tua Pelotu gives you that nose uh, ability, and that, that's good. You know, that, that's good right there. I so, don't think they're keeping six linebackers. Uh, unless you're counting a Kerrigan or an Avery, we can probably count them as pass rushers. But I'm looking at Wilson, Singleton. I do think Edwards will make it because he's actually a fairly good special teams player mm-hmm. as well. Okay. Um, Taylor probably will make it on. Just got to see what he's got in he here too. To. So that's four. Again, Kerrigan and, and Avery kind of counting the pass. As far as inside linebackers, I don't – Sean Bradley, I think they, they'll keep one more between Stevens, Bradley, Patrick Johnson, and and um and uh that's well as those are three. I think one of those guys will probably make it. Yeah, so we'll count Kerrigan for now as a DN. We know he's gonna stand up too, but we're gonna count him right as a DN, uh you know, at, at first. So we'll take him out of the mix there. So we don't have to worry about him making it uh against the num- keeping five or six linebackers. Wilson's winning a job in terms of competition, he's starting. Mm-hmm. Singleton mm-hmm. will make it. Edwards will make it as the so, – because they have him for specials. But the big one is against run-heavy teams. That's three. Mm-hmm. Taylor, because he's a third-round pick last year, is four. The fifth guy, um, Sean Bradley, I know he's a spe- he could be a really good special teams player. He's probably never going to play on defense. That's – I think if you have your druthers, if you're an NFL team, you draft him strictly for specials. Right. And he doesn't play. And then Patrick Johnson – He'll have to earn his way in. Who's a who's a seventh rounder? Mm-hmm. It's kind of like the the kid uh, Teron Johnson. We didn't talk about him because we're not we don't have him making the team. We don't. Well, these are the kind of guys Teron Johnson, mm-hmm. uh, Jacoby Stevens. We'll talk about them in training camp. We're not going to talk about them now because we don't have them on the team. Right. If, if they're doing well in training camp, they're going to talk about. Them. We talk yes. about everyone who's doing well. Or if if a high round pick is struggling, we're going to talk about. Them. That's what we do. Yeah, but we're not going to talk about a guy we don't think is going to contribute. That's just. The way I think it is. it's it's safe to say because you have a new staff. Um, it, it's possible if Jacoby Stevens, if it's neck and neck, if if Jacoby Stevens and Sean Bradley, if they feel are equally talented, 
then they're probably going to go with Stevens because they drafted him. He's younger. He's a rookie, you know, and this is a new regime. But um, I mean, Stevens versus Bradley. I mean, they're only one after the one year after the other. But Jacoby's was drafted by this regime. Yeah, Bradley was dra- uh, drafted gotcha. by a Jim Schwartz yeah. regime. Sure. So I, I feel like you just tend to favor your own the guys that you scouted and you uh, you maybe in, you impressed. Yeah. I mean, Howie's been here, but it's how the coaches are going to try to influence Howie. Yeah, well, that's a, that's what I was going to get to. See, I don't know. You and I could go over draft picks over the years. We've outlined the J.J. Ortega Whiteside literally one week after he was drafted. We said this is what happened. Mm-hmm. You know, with the, the ownership and the analytics and all that stuff. You know, like a guy in the sixth round. It's hard to know, did the coaches influence it? Because Jim Schwartz, I know Roseman dismissed that he, he bristled at it, but we've talked about it. It's been written by the Inquirer and the Athletic. Jim Schwartz had had an impact on the drafts. Mm-hmm. Maybe on Taylor was a Jim Schwartz pick. He didn't pick him. I just know that there was pressure from Schwartz to draft a linebacker, whether it was a second round, third round, what it was first round with the right. kid that went to the Chargers. Kenneth Murray, right. After yeah, they didn't really take Kenneth him. Murray, the pressure really ratcheted up to get a yes, linebacker. We, right. Yes, we've heard that uh, separately, that uh, Schwartz was on their front office to draft a linebacker. That's why I do believe that it, we weren't in there, but I feel like there was some pressure to draft one. Now, we have we don't know why they didn't – they, you know why did they like a linebacker in the fourth or fifth round? We, we can't answer that, but mm-hmm. um, it's kind of like the, you know the, the mistakes they made in twenty twenty. Seems like they made up for it in this draft in terms of going by the board mostly, mostly, right, and sticking by it by what what the way that the board was set, and we'll see how that goes. But st- finishing off linebacker here, I would mostly agree with you. Stevens has got remember he's converting from safety to linebacker. It's not easy to do. Mm-hmm. Um, there aren't a ton of uh, guys who've done it. The best example is Thomas Davis, who won't be a Hall of Famer, who, who went to Georgia. But, man, was he a terrific linebacker. Uh, being an undersized guy, built his body up, came in at uh, low 230s and built himself up with, with Panthers, was a terrific player, big-time leader. We'll see. Jacoby Shaq Stevens. And, I think Shaq, I'm Thompson, sorry? Shaq Thompson has done that Shaq for Carolina. Thompson. I can't yeah, believe you didn't who, bring up nasty Well, he was Nate the first Gary. rounder, but, yeah, he was the first rounder. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I'm Nick Gary, come on. Oh, White God. Snake, maybe. <laughs> but you know the crazy thing? The guy started. The guy, the, of course, Ken Flagel, that was his son. So, you know. Of course. Uh, now, Nate Gary recently was released. Yeah. That, well, he has an injury, right? He, he oh, has an okay. injury. But All yeah, right. he was released, right? Uh, he's got to show the conversion. And right uh, to me, he's on the outside looking in. If he, if he could have a great camp, maybe he pushes for the spot. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe they keep six, but. This team, because they're nickel, they're only going to be playing two linebackers mostly. They don't need to keep more than five. I would agree with you on that. All right, let's move over to cornerback. Um, there's one spot that I don't think that there's competition at, and that's because it's being held down by Darius Slay. Now, the other spot is um, at some point we're going to have some fun with this where I'm going to create like one of those wheels that we spin and just see where the uh, where the arrow lands on any given day. Be like, you, you are the starting cornerback next to Darius Slay. Uh, and it might be like that in training. I here's what I wonder, Adam. When when the Eagles come out as a team for their first team drill, right, in training camp, in cornerback opposite outside corner opposite area. Who gets the first shot? Oh, it'll be it'll be funny because I fell for this as a young reporter in the 2000s. I didn't know any better. Uh-huh. Just as you set it up, right? I would. This is for t- before Twitter when I was writing for Scout.com. Like when I got there was camp, life before Twitter. I know. I, didn't I know. realize that. Hard to believe. <laughs> yeah, but I would. I would. Um, I was blogging for Scout.com. Whenever I go to my training camp tour, I just would write up notes and go, okay. For, so this guy took the first reps, and it was like a big deal. I didn't realize that it didn't matter because they're ro- they're rotating. Teams typically the first couple of days will give. They'll just rotate. They just they're not about depth charts. They just want to give a lot of guys reps. I didn't know that it didn't really mean very much. And then, well, of course, the media, all of us didn't understand that. It didn't really mean anything. So so, so the uh, the bloggers would pick it up, the news aggregators. Oh, my God, this guy took reps with the first round. With I'm Excuse me, with the first team defense. Oh, my God, it's breaking news. Mm-hmm. No, it didn't really mean anything. Just tell me after two weeks if he's still doing it. That's the yep. thing. That, that, so you don't want to go crazy the first couple of days. You certainly want to note it, but don't overrate really what it means. I would agree with you. But nonetheless, I want you to answer the question. Okay. Who's, the who's first guy? going to be the first guy given the shot opposite Darius? Okay. Slay? If they don't have Steven Nelson, 
Of course, assuming that they don't have Steven Nelson. Yes, and we've actually hit our, our quotient. We've ha actually talked about it 20 times the last three shows. We actually get five <laughs> bucks for it. No. Um, oh, nice. Good. Yeah. From Deal Dash, you get free bids. I would say Maddox, obviously, if Nelson's not here because he, they have to. After that, you know, the thing no, about that's the a cop out because I'm I'm talking about they're coming out in nickel and, and Maddox is in the slot. Who, oh, who oh, 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 um, I'm gonna go McPherson. Oh, sure, for sure. You think so? I think yeah, it's what? gonna be, I think it would be Craig James. Really? Yeah, all right. Well, he's the veteran, he's not technically vested, but of the group that's been here for three years, yeah, right, sure. Maybe, maybe Michael Jaquette, but I would still think Craig James has been here for a, a little bit longer, he has actually played. Uh, mm -hmm. more than any of these guys. Now, I'll say this. There's an outside chance, no pun intended, that maybe it's Josiah Scott. No, I don't see that. No, 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 no. I know no. they want to – we know that they want to look at him on the outside yes. and think that – but yes. they're not going to give him the first crack on the, just bringing him in. I think it's we should go on. We should Craig go James. on. Oh, sorry? I think, I, I think Craig James. All right, so you got James. This is good. Um, uh -huh. And in and, and the, the YouTube comment, folks, give, give us uh, – I'm gonna go with McPherson. I'm probably gonna be wrong. Okay. It, it, not again. It doesn't mean anything because I would I would think if they don't have Stephen Nelson, they'll just split the first team with James and McPherson, and maybe a little bit of J Jaquette, as uh -huh. uh, I've been told ten times to pronounce it. Jaquette. Yeah, yeah. It seems ridiculous, but uh, it should be Jaquette. Hey, what do I know? Uh, Tell this man how he should pronounce his name. <laughs> no, 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 no. Because I thought it was French. I know. I took, I thought so. you know, I I took thought French in college and... in high school. Yeah, mm -hmm. I thought it'd be Jaquette. but uh, Josiah Scott. Now, could he eventually get first team reps? Yeah, it just th this is where after three or four days, the coaches review it with the the front office when they watch their practice tape. You go, okay, here's what we saw the first week. Yeah, and then they 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 look at it and say, okay, who's done the best? And then they start getting a pecking order. That's yeah. when you start saying as they head into the second week, which will be the first week of August. Okay. Because they report on the 27th. Their first practice is the 28th, as I understand it. I, it doesn't really have anything to do with being pads or not being pads. It's just how they perform. So in the first week of August, we're going to start. We're going to hit it hard. Okay, here's what we're hearing about who's doing well and who's not. I thought maybe you might say Kevon Seymour just because you were so impressed with his interview with you guys on Sirius XM. That oh, you I forgot about it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I have him on the roster, but – I think McPherson, I just know how much they like this kid. And he he's 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 a pretty sharp kid. I think he's gonna I think he's gonna win this thing. If they don't get Nelson, just, yeah, let's do the I, end game here. Yeah, I could let's see do, that, but they usually make these guys work for it. Like they don't first day of practice take a fourth round pick and say, Here, you're you're gonna start a corner just to see what you got. Usually they make these guys, you know, climb a little bit. I do, I agree, but I, I think in the end game. For mm -hmm. the three weeks, two and a half weeks of training camp, and three preseason games, pre three preseason games, and two combined practices. Well, I think Zach McPherson will wind up starting if they do not get Steven Nelson or trade for someone. But they, you know, they they say they're going to do something at some point. Um, yep. They're not panicking um, now. Whatever that winds up being, as Harry Roseman said in his press conference, he goes, he reminded everybody about Ronald Darby. I think that was a pretty good. No, I think that's a pretty good nugget that they're going to do something without giving it away who that's going to be. Right. Um, again, folks, it may not be the, 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 the initial 53 when they have those cuts in late August, the last cut. And they have three cuts this year. How about that? How about that? I can't wait. I, sometimes um, we, we as a news media can be very predictable. So yeah. I can't wait for the first practice, uh, assuming if Nelson's not here you're going to see either Craig James or maybe Jaquette start opposite Slay in the first practice. And then after the practice, he's going to get surrounded by six or seven reporters. Yeah. And they're all going to ask, what it, you know, are you, you know, you ran with the first team. What's that like? Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and Craig or, or Michael, they're going to be like, well, I'm getting an opportunity and I don't plan on relinquishing it. I'm going to give it to my fullest. And I think I can handle it. And everybody's going to write the same story about how, you know, here's a, the Eagles are weak at corner, but it's a chance for either James, Jaquette, Seymour, whoever, and he's not going to let it go. And then literally two days later, it'll be like Steven Nelson will get signed or somebody else will be there in camp. And, and all oh, the story will be completely <laughs> obsolete. The guy will wind up getting cut like two weeks all later. All that work, the beam reporters did it. It doesn't uh, mean anything. Right? Well, listen, okay. I'm not making fun of him because I'm yeah. that was me 10 I know. to 12. You know, like, I, dude, that's the I've, story. <laughs> I, I've done game stories, had him done. I hated doing like, game stories were like pain for me because I would I only done a couple. I'd only done a couple of my career. Uh -huh. The Miracle in the Meadowlands too. I wrote it at the end of the third quarter. It was done, all sealed, 
And I jinxed it. I opened my stupid mouth and jinxed it. Uh, I said, oh, we might have overtime here. It's a stupid idiot. Yeah. This happened. Uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just saying I jinxed it and I had to redo my entire story. Right. As you know, you were you at that you were at that game, right? For Comcast. I believe so. Yeah. So at Giant Stadium, and the, everything changed when when uh, Vic went off in the fourth quarter. Oh and they, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was. Djax had the right. you know punt, the punt return for touchdown. So anyway, that's um, what we call a Control Alt Delete Day. Yeah, where it's just, a thousand fifteen hundred words I wrote were yeah. all just wiped away. Bob within. Ford <laughs> gave me the look. <laughs> and it might have been Ru- well, I don't think it was Ruben. One one of the other B reporters like, dude, what are you? Why would you do them? I'm so sorry. I'm I'm dumb. Like, you know, in don't... baseball, you're not allowed yeah. to say the ei words. Right. Um, actually, you know, you're not allowed to say that. Yeah. You, you can do not. You know, say that. I just I just went with it. I'm a, you know, <laughs> as an observer, I just watched. Sure. I don't sure. think something. Yeah. We're, we're all human. Anyway, getting back to this corner group. So here's how we have making it. We've got Slay, Maddox, James, McPherson, Jaquette. That's about it. And and um, and the got kid they got from Buffalo and Carolina. Josiah uh, Scott. Oh no no Buffalo and Carolina. Who's that? I'm. I'm um, Seymour. Corner. Yeah, Kevon Seymour. Yeah, because he's yeah. at least has experience. He has That's six corners. Game. I don't think six are making six are make corners are making this team. Um. I would say five with a chance to keep somebody on a practice. I would squad. say I would say Jaquette will not make it. Uh, as I, I just think he's a perfect developmental guy. He only had the one good half of football. Man, he's their only not, only guy that has any size. You think he's not? I know, make but it? you know what? It, it's about can you play the, the position at a high enough level for them to put you out there consistently? Right. I mean, when when you look at their schedule now, Washington's upgraded their receiver group a little bit. Dallas has got three kids who are just incredibly mm-hmm. gifted. Mm-hmm. Um. Giants now are the, the men, they could do whatever they want because they're so deep at receiver all of a sudden. Yep. Um, I'd mentioned the Jets earlier. They're not great, but I mean they're they're gonna they're they're much better than they were at corner. Tampa, Kansas you? City. I mean, oh my to, god. <laughs> oh. Do I have to keep, keep going? The Chargers. The Chargers have good receivers, right? They've got okay. I mean, Allen, they've great. got Michael, Mike, uh, Mike Williams. Yeah, Josh um, Palmer, Cosell's yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're decent. Yeah. Um, look, they've they've they're going to have challenges this year. Uh, at, uh, do they they don't do they play Seattle again? Mm, uh, do they play Seattle? Real quick, I because I want to see Dwayne Eskridge. I don't think they do play Seattle this year. Okay, let's go through this real quick as we go through this because this applies obviously to their cornerback position. Okay, week right. one against Atlanta with Julio gone, they're not very good at, at receiver. The Niners are a two receiver team. They don't have, they have no depth right now. Mohamed Sanu will be the third receiver, so they can't afford an injury, so they're okay right. there. Now this is what murders row. Dallas. Dallas. Those three receivers. Okay. Yep. As you just said, Kansas City. Now Carolina, mm-hmm. all of a sudden now, we'll see if Terrace Marshall could get on the field with DJ Moore, Robbie Anderson, uh, and uh Terrace Marshall. David Moore is not a bad backup receiver. Who is like Yeah. I'm not gonna put that in the in the group of the other teams we mentioned, but it's it's right. it's it's formidable. You're gonna have to have somebody who can right. cover DJ Moore, you put Slay on, then you have to have somebody who can cover Robbie Anderson and then see what Terrace Marshall's all about. Yeah. And then Tampa, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, AB. Yeah, don't, you don't have to name them. We all know. Yeah, you guys are. <laughs> my bad. Uh, and then uh, week seven at the Raiders. Okay. At the Raiders. Um, you, you could got be rugs. Okay. You got, um, they don't Brian have Aguilar Agu- anymore. I like, right. Aguilar's gone. John Brown could run. Yeah. yeah you could hang in that one. Yeah, Detroit. They have a terrible receiver core. Nine. You mentioned the Chargers, so they've got a break now. Denver is like five deep at receiver. Plus yeah, Denver's a pretty good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a tough one. Saints only have Michael Thomas. I know he's great, but he's not a burner. Giants is tough. Jets I mentioned earlier. Then after the bye, Washington with McLaurin, McLaurin and um, Samuel. Yeah, Curtis Samuel. Right, exactly. Who's and a remember they drafted um, a kid a lot of people like Diami Brown out of North Carolina. Diami Brown could run. Cosell likes him a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, Giants again. Washington again, and week 18, oh, you're right, week 18, I hate saying that, week 18, it's so weird, mm-hmm. with the extra game, Dallas, so there are some pockets here, it's extremely difficult, they got to get a veteran, man, they just cannot start the season without a veteran, I don't care, look, if they get one on uh, 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 September 3rd, now obviously the guys got to learn the defense, but they they know this, we know it, my mom knows this, they have to do something to corner. Absolutely. All right, let's uh, finish it off. We'll, we'll head over to safety. Yep. Before that, I want to uh, take a minute to uh, thank our friends at PHL Sports Nation. Make sure you go check out all of their great content, all of their coverage at PHL Sports Nation. 
Philadelphia.com, enhancing the fans' experience with their coverage of our Philadelphia sports teams. Uh, you can find them on Twitter, at PHL Sports Nation. Uh, and, of course, we'll take a, a quick moment to uh, hear from our other great sponsors, including our friends at Sky Motor Cars. If you head into Sky Motor Cars out there in Westchester, make sure you tell them Adam and Jeff sent you. You'll get a great deal. All right. The safety picture is interesting only because we don't yet know if Rodney McLeod will be ready by the season opener. I would like to assume he will because the ACL surgeries, Adam, have not been as uh, lengthy of a rehab process as they were 10 to 12 years ago. But, you know, it did happen later in the season and he is a little bit older. So I'm sure they're going to be careful with him. But he's obviously going to make the team. Um, they don't have that many bodies, really. I mean, could, could legitimately all five guys make it? McLeod, Harris, Kavon Wallace, Epps, and Andrew and uh, Andrew Adams? Yeah. Let's get started with McLeod. See, he his surgery was in late December. Mm -hmm. So he literally could be right up against the season whether he's re ready or not. And, and, and if he doesn't practice in training camp, I just don't know how effective he's going to be. So, you know, we want to talk about battles here, but it's kind of like here's the way I see it. Tell me if you agree. We've got McLeod, let's say for, as you said, we'll put him on the roster for now, not on, well, he'll, he'll obviously have to start training camp on PUP. The question is, when will, will he be on, on uh, reserve PUP to start the season, which means he misses the first six weeks. We'll see. Mm -hmm. If he mm -hmm. Harris starts, we know that. McLeod, if he's able to, will be the other starter. The battle now is for the third safety. Is it Epps, who's the veteran uh, of the group, because he's been here for a couple of years. At least he knows, he, and he knows his defense in Minnesota. Wallace, who's a second-year player, didn't play very much as a rookie. Andrew Adams is mostly a fourth safety and a special teamer. So the five are pretty obvious. It, the battle to me is for who's going to be that first safety off the bench. If they want to play big nickel, which is three safeties, who's that first guy? Who is that first guy? Is it Kavon? Well, again, that might be situational as well. Wallace is more of a of a guy who can come down, stop, and make a tackle, stop the run. I know he didn't show it as much last year, but that was the book on him. Epps is supposed to be a little bit better in the pass game coverage as a post safety. So we'll 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 see there. Andrew Adams is has played, but he's mainly a special teams guy. Uh, this is a position where Adam, I know we've said this about other spots, but you really the coaches have to cross their fingers and hope there are no major injuries because they're going to get to the. You could get to the bottom of the barrel real quick if you have more than one injury, especially if Rodney's not ready to come back by the opener and Anthony Harris lips off the field, right? And then you're down to Kavon Wallace, Marcus Epps, and one backup and Andrew Adams. You may have to right. find now, now, Kobe Stevens and move him back to safety. Right. Well, the guys like Elijah Riley and Gray Lenore, and we'll talk about them only in training camp if they are pushing for a roster spot. Right. Now, Arnold's got positional versatility. Uh, Riley's only a safety. Arnold may be able to may be able to do both safety and corner. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see. Again, they're on the outside looking in, obviously. But we'll right. see what happens in training camp. Um, Wallace is a thumper. I, I just don't know from a coverage standpoint if he's going to be good enough. Right. But um, – there are a lot of question marks here. This, this is, we know Linebacker's got some serious questions. The, you know, the other thing is you like to, over time now, because Harris is on a one-year deal, he turns 30 in October. We know why he's here. I and mean, if he plays well, he certainly could come back for another and sign an extension. Marcus Epps knows the defense. Uh, he was a draftee of the Vikings. Yep. Rodney McLeod is an older player. I mean, you, you again, you don't know what he's going to be. He's, he, he's now 31. He's had two serious injuries with the Eagles. Here's the mm -hmm. question. What's the future of the safety position? We haven't really talked about this before, but it's about time that we do. What do you mean we don't I scream about it every episode. Yeah. Well, no, I know. You know you're the man with that. No, but here's my question. Uh -huh. Past this season, what's the safety position look like? I don't know. Who, what are the free agents going to be? Because that's really where they, they try to, to address that position. Uh, obviously, with McLeod and Malcolm Jenkins, they did a good job, so – I'm assuming it's going to be addressed in free agency because they're not going to use a first or a second <laughs> and probably not a third round pick on it. Correct. I mean, am I wrong? Am I, I mean, I'm, unless it's just that year out of every 15 to 20 years where they finally do it. Yeah. And look, last year was the guy chin was, you know, we, we noticed after the draft last year, chin was going to be the guy. Right. And right. they, uh, you know, they made a decision uh, not then to go with that guy. Cards. I'm right. sorry. Then as uh, he was the guy and then he wasn't the guy. Yeah, so they went with Hertz, and we'll see how that works out this season. Right. Uh, but fact of the matter is, they got some serious questions for the future in their secondary. There's very little that we know. Uh, Slay will be with them at minimum through contract structure through 22. 
that, that Maddox is not even signed past this season. So, folks, there's some there's a there's a there's serious questions at linebacker as it always are. Yeah, but really in the secondary, more than I could remember for the future. Uh, if we, if if people are being fair and honest and objective, and anything can happen, but it's a very pedestrian secondary, and it's really going to struggle. I know people say, but the defensive line is really good, and a pass rush helps. Remember, the Eagles last year, I believe, were top three or four in sacks. I mean, they got a lot of sacks. They were last number one. Year. The D line was number one. The number NFL. one in sacks, and yet they were twentieth overall in defense. And this is probably no better of it and maybe in some stages a little bit worse from linebacker to corner to safety than last year. So it doesn't – yes, a defense, a good pass rush can help your your back end, your secondary, but it does not make miracles. You know, I mean, good quarterbacks know what they're going to do with the ball before the snap. They know where the weaknesses are. Uh, yeah, occasionally they'll get hit and, and it'll get a sack too. But it's not – it's also not a, not a playmaking defense. So even if you are getting a lot of sacks, are you turning those into – takeaways which this team has not done a lot of the last few years and I look at this on paper and I say it's just I, the reality is it should struggle against decent to good offenses I, I don't know how how to look at it any other way to be honest well it goes on what you said the, our one criticism we got from other teams again on Jim Schwartz it, it was it was you couldn't challenge it because it's on coaching tape I mean it was just I mean I cannot tell you how many conversations I've had about this mm -hmm. the lack of pre-snap disguise Post snap movement to the sky to, to 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 as you just said to make the quarterback have some hesitation to just think a little bit right. about where he's going with the football. They just didn't do it under Jim Schwartz. Now they right. get away with it sometimes because their pass rush is so good, mm -hmm. but you can't depend on that. Well, as you said, what happens if the pass rush isn't getting there? And then they were also by PFF either number one or number two in pressures. Mm -hmm. But because the scheme is different, this is as we're told a more of read and react defense. I I I just. I don't know. I, I don't know. I know Gannis was supposed to be pretty innovative and smart and all this stuff, but you know, that's great. But if you don't have the if you don't have the talent on the back end, and today's NFL, today's NFL where it's a passing league. Right. You don't dictate it. You throw the football a lot more than you run it. I don't know, man. I for people I know people are taking the over at six and a half for the Eagles. I think there's a lot of upside on this offense, but and I think the staff is pretty good from what we're hearing. I, I just don't know. As you just outlined it, you even made me think about it stronger. And, and as Cosell did on, on our show with him, this yeah. secondary has got some major problems. Yeah. Major. Yeah. It's, it's you know, I'm, I think I'm being kind when I say pedestrian. Well, it could, be, honest, be, a bad, it could be a bad secondary, but we'll see. We don't throw pom-poms, folks. We're, we're, no. we're, we're not purposely trying to criticize a team. We're, we want to give you what's likely yeah. to happen Yeah, based on personnel. We Yes, stranger things have happened. C-2017. This mm -hmm. is Rochester's not as good as 2017. It's no, here's a question. Really. For you. Mm -hmm. Joe Banner told me when we worked at ESPN, it was our last year together in 2016. He thought the Eagles had one of the best Rochester's in 2016. He and I argued over this, and I told him he's out of his mind. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. He's like, oh, other teams think so. I'm like, all right, I just don't agree with you. They were seven and nine, and the Eagles thought that they underachieved. The next year they won the Super Bowl, but they added a lot of talent. Mm -hmm. If you compare this roster to 2016's roster, I know that's. Let me just give you some names. Let me just real quick before we get out of here. I, I well, love I this. Mean, one thing that stands out was the, the wide receivers on the 2016 right. team were abysmal. Terrible. Awful. It, okay. DGB, your guy. Okay. Yeah. He's on that team. Yeah. Aguilar, Aguilar was, was an outside receiver that year. Yeah. Aguilar was terrible. This is when he had the meltdown. Right. Jordan Matthews was in a regression. Bryce Treggs is now an agent, I think. I think yes. I know he's, he's working trying for to one be, of the Yeah. 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 Trying to. Right. Josh Huff. What a motley crew! Ooh. Yeah, but the, what, that that was those were that was that is the Eagles wide receiver version of what they are at linebacker right now. Just a bunch. Oh, of, I don't agree with that. I think they're. I think. I think. I think Wilson's a good. Wilson fits the scheme, and Jordan Matthews was a good enough player. He fit the scheme. He caught like 50, 60 balls a year. Yeah. He wasn't bad. He just wasn't yeah. explosive, and he wasn't a playmaker. And neither is Eric Wilson. He's a Eric Wilson's a backup. He signed a one year deal. He was a backup. I'll take Alex Singleton for three over of his four receiver. years. How about this? Well, based on the way that Aguilar played in in, in uh, sixteen, it's terrible. Uh -huh. Doug Peterson's first year. I'll take Singleton over Aguilar, comparatively speaking. You will take who? <laughs> Singleton over Aguilar, comparatively speaking? No, okay. because because no, no, <laughs> no. Right. Just that year. Just that year, though, because then he, he obviously he turned his career around at seventeen. Who, who knew? You know, who would have believed it? But he did. It's a great right. story. Yeah, um, I feel like we're splitting hairs here. My, my point know, is that, that, funny, was the, 
the real weakness of the offense was the wide receiver, like like linebacker is for this team. Yeah. Here's another one. You know, I was make I was making fun of Michael Jaquette's name. Here's another one. No one could I can never get it right. I actually had to call the agent uh because I can never get it right. Was it Alan Barbary or Alan Barber? <laughs> Well, he's. I feel like Alan Barbary told us it was Barbary and then said, no, it's actually Barber. I, I mean, I've never – this was the strangest <laughs> thing. For He was with Seattle. I remember, like, it might have been at Seattle's training camp. He was with a couple teams, but I, I think it was where I saw him in Seattle or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what an odd name. B-A-R-B-R-E. Was that Babar with two Bs? <laughs> I feel like that, that was I don't know. Fun. I don't have any elephant books. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, but it just, it's just funny. Um, and th th Look, Ryan Matthews was toast that year. Didn't he get hurt in 16? He got hurt every year. Yeah, yeah. But they're lying. I mean, Brandon Brooks was a stud. Lane, Lane Johnson, unfortunately, got suspended that year. Yep. Uh, Peters, uh, D-line, you know, they had an interesting defense then. But who this is the, the who were the corners team. that year? Two thousand. It was bad. It was bad. It was no, like what? Nolan Carroll and yep. um, Leotis McKelvin. Leotis McKelvin. Oh. They were great at safety with Malcolm and, and uh, Malcolm they Jenkins. Were. And, oh, they were and, tremendous. Yeah, and Rodney. Rodney was there, right? And, that was good. And last year, well, two. Year, okay, they were great at linebacker. Hicks was a stud. I was just about to say they were not bad at linebacker no, that year. Really good. Invested. Bradham was yeah. terrific. Hicks, Hicks, and Bradham yeah. were good. We talked about the last show, Kendricks, right? Yeah, and Kendricks, right? And then my guy Stephen Tullock. Remember that the push that the fans gave for the Eagles to have him on the roster? Oh, oh my yeah. god, the fans loved him because he was a cerebral thumper, yep. knew Schwartz, knew the system, and he was at the end of his career. And Kumu Gurje Hill was a backup. Najee Good, who was actually on and off the Eagles roster for five years. Five I know. Years. He was decent. And then he went to the Colts yeah. and played significantly for them the next yeah, year. Yeah, it's so, a pretty good story. So, yeah, no, that that see, so I see similarities, some really bad weaknesses on that team, which was yeah. wide receiver and corner. But their D line was good. Their linebackers were way better than this year's linebackers. Their safeties were way better than this year's safeties. And this is the same offensive line, but five, what, six years later. For these guys, Brooks and Kelsey and Johnson, they were really good that year. They're still good, but think about that. Think about how much time has passed since that year and now, and they're still on the team. So decline will inevitably set in at some point. So, sure. and, and of course, you know, obviously the quarterback makes a big difference. And if Jalen Hurts is really, really good, then this team can compete. But it's just going to be hard to mask how the deficiencies of this of this back seven on defense. It's really going to be difficult. Uh, Jonathan Gannon can be smart. And I'm mm -hmm. sure he can do a lot of, we expect, pre-snap movement, post-snap movement, a lot of different looks, confusion. I, I'm, I'm sure he's going to do all that. And I'm sure at times it's going to work, but that's going to be on tape after a few weeks and people are going to see it. And the, the cream always rises to the top eventually. You have to have the talent. I agree. No, we, you and I are seeing this. So, so to me, the D-line's going to have to get pressure. Even if they're read and react, they're going to have to win because they're not good enough quarter. Steven Nelson obviously could, could change it. We mm -hmm. kind of outlined the battles as we could uh, as we speak here. We're let now less than two weeks before training camp. We're actually uh, 12 days mm -hmm. uh, before they report. So, look, it's getting closer, folks. Can't wait. And uh, can't wait for those combined practices, two sets of joint practices. Hallelujah. Going, to be, fun. Going yeah. to be fun. All right, so we've wrapped it up there. Those were our defensive battles. We did offensive battles. And uh, look forward to getting into our, our content again next week. We'll have our, our podcast, our stories podcast coming out soon. That's going to do it for this. Oh, right, one last thing real quick. Somebody yeah. reached out to us on the website, asked us the question. We can both answer. Okay. And um, they wanted to know if the Eagles subscribe to PFF stats. And they all they do. Every them. team gets it. Just so you know, every NFL team has them. Correct. Um, they also, and by the way, the stats that they provide NFL teams are not what's available to the public. Uh, they yeah, there's a whole lot right. more. Right. It's a lot of money, by the way. It's a lot of money. Their, right. their stat package, the one that teams get, um, it's out there so we can talk about it. I, I, mm -hmm. I've i known about this for a couple of years, but uh, it was actually reported by the Athletics, so I, I'll talk about it. Well, our, Warren Sharp, who I'm going to try to get on here with us, mm -hmm. who's terrific, he is – I don't like him just because he's a passive game guy. Just His stuff is irrefutable information. It's just ridiculously great. Mm -hmm. He's a consultant to a bunch of NFL teams, including the Eagles. Um, he's terrific, and I – I know he couldn't, if we had him on, he obviously couldn't talk about the Eagles. I, I guess whatever. He probably can't talk about what he does for teams. But um, he, you should get his um, his uh, training camp guide. He just put it out. He is so good. I've met him before. He is so good, man. He is, uh, mm -hmm. he, he's tremendous. Oh, yeah. He's, he's, he's a so good much follow, yeah. 
he is he backs everything up. He's not just an analytics guy. He backs it up. He knows enough about football to back everything up with not just statistics, but information of how – and it's predictive information, how te- teams are going to struggle because they don't understand when to throw one to run. He's really mm-hmm. good with that stuff. But, right. uh, yeah, the Eagles are – obviously, they, they get every – another one that I like is Sports Info Solutions. They're also very good. Right. I want to, to to clarify for the, the questioner, though. There's a difference yeah. between sort of subjective data and just stat – analysis stats right um yeah their gradings which is what the public is more familiar with pff gradings you know this guy got this for the week or this for the year yeah. that's kind of what i call their subjective uh analysis where you can kind of argue about you know, some of the weird stats right but they're, they're they're good but it's it's subjective nonetheless they also compile stats that teams use for example how many times does an offensive tackle get rushed by a three technique compared to a five technique compared to a seven technique yards per route or depth uh, of a wide receiver's yards? All that stuff is not arguable. It's just facts that they break down through a million statisticians and algorithms. That's the stuff that the NFL, t- that's what, that I understand the Eagles and other NFL teams use, not, not rankings or gradings, but more of the, the data uh, that you get from that you parse through in a, in a game. That's not arguable. It's just this is what it is, you know. So yes. that's, that's the best way I can describe it. Yes, and coaches, man, it, it's funny story. Before we get out of here, talking about PFF over the years, as much as some coaches criticize PFF, they use all of them use it. They'll, they'll it, it's just real. I get kind of kick out of because even with the run game truthers, they also still use it because they they want to know what teams are doing to them, and they want to mm-hmm. know, okay, if we do this, what will the, what's the predictive result? It's just kind of funny. Um, I know Jack Del Rio, who's Mr. Run Game. I know he uses them. He likes he likes it. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, they're so good. I, I, I love their stuff. But again, I'm with you. I don't agree with some of the grading. Well, the right. ones that would drive me out of my mind were the halftime grades. I hope they junked them. They're just so useless. <laughs> yeah. How it's, can, it's you're, really you're not watching coaching tape. When you don't know what the scheme yeah. is, the call yeah, is, what the protection ridiculous. is. Yeah. You can't grade off of TV tape. It's just the, the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You can watch <laughs> it. you got to watch. But to grade hard off of TV tape, you can't see. You get one camera angle. It's not. It's right. not fair. That, it's actually that's not fair. Why to do that. It's important to clarify. That's not teams don't. The NFL teams don't care about the rankings or anything. They yeah. care more about the data. You know that they can. That's non arguable. Correct. One thing on TV tape. Do want to add this, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. I know some coordinators and position coaches because the the um the t- they they get they want to see something because the um the all twenty two the teams shoot their own tape. Let's say they don't get it till 10 o'clock at night and they play at a 1 o'clock game. They'll actually watch the TV copy. Let's say they get home at 6 o'clock or they'll go to their office and watch the TV copy. It's actually funny because they just want they just want something to look at immediately. It's actually kind of funny. And then they get, of course, the real copy and then it's all different. Of course. All right. Good stuff there. All right. That's going to do it for this edition of Inside the Birds, the leading podcast in Eagles Intel. Big thanks to our producer, Hunter Brody. You can check out his YouTube channel. It's called Sports Talk with Broads. Head to his new website, brodesmedia.com, or find him on Twitter, at Broads81. And as always, we thank you for flying with us inside the birds.